All right. Can I retire with $650,000 saved for retirement? That's what we're going to talk about today on the Your Financial EKG YouTube channel. We're going to look at a couple. They're 55 and 50 years old. They've got $650,000 saved for retirement. And we are going to do a Your Financial EKG retirement income plan. And I want to look at taxes. I want to look at will their money last throughout their retirement. And I want to go through some of the details that we go through when we're building out a retirement and a Your Financial EKG plan. Now, listen, if you have questions, comments, put those in the chat, put them in the comment section, make sure you smash that like button, but let's get ready to go. And if you notice, we've got the baseball jersey on today. It is opening day of baseball season. If you, whatever team you like, leave that in the comment section. We are raised. Now, what we're going to do, we've got Stephen and Claire Adams here. And what I want to do is I want to go through their current scenario and I want to break it down individually. So I want to go through this. I want to build this plan out in more in a kind of a fundamental way so you can see how we build out plans for clients. So you don't have to worry about all the other, I just want to kind of do this detail, detail, detail and show you how we do this. So we've got Stephen and Claire and Stephen works in IT and Claire's a homemaker. So we already know right off the bat because Stephen is working and Claire works from home or yeah, I say work from home because we have three children and my wife definitely works more than me. We actually read an article about stay at home parents. And if you take all the hours of stay at home parents, it's like double the hours that I actually work at the office. So homemakers, they actually do work a lot more. So Claire's a homemaker. She raises the kids or did raise the kids. Most of them are gone at this point. So already off the bat, since we know that Claire is a homemaker, that Social Security is going to be one of the big decision points that we're going to have to look at in this plan. So we want to make sure we run through a Social Security uh, income estimator. We want to make sure we look at the benefits planner and then we want to add that all in to our plan to make sure that Social Security, um, it, we're making the right decision when it comes to claiming Social Security. Now, projected retirement date, we're going to say 55 years old at this point. What we like to do is say, can, if we want to retire now or in the near future, let's look at retiring now and then we'll base our date of retirement just on the facts and figures. And we've got to go through what the numbers are. Numbers don't lie. Math doesn't lie. OK, politicians lie, but math doesn't lie. And so what we do is we try to take the math and say, OK, based on this math, this is when you can retire. So let's do Social Security first. And let's add all this in. Matthew, <laughs> Matthew says Red Sox all the way. Not in the American League East, man. It's going to be the raise. I'm telling you, it's going to be the raise this year. So let's go to Social Security benefits. So for Stephen, his primary benefit at 67, we'll just put it in the calculator first. His primary, his benefit value at full retirement age is $3,200. So his benefit, his full retirement benefit at age 67 is $3,200. And as you can see here, if he decides to claim it at 62, he'd only get 2240, right? That's 70% of his full retirement benefit. If he claimed it at 67, he's going to get 100% of his full retirement benefit, which is that 3200. And if he goes till 70, I say if you're a broccoli eater, you're an overachiever, then he would get 3968, which is 124% of his full retirement benefit. Now, obviously, any time in between here, age 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 68, 69, you can claim Social Security. So which is why we want to put these numbers in and get a good idea when we're going through the EKG when we want to make this decision. Like, when do we want to claim Social Security? And we'll look at that here in just a second when we're talking about retirement income. But think about it this way. We want our Social Security decision to be flexible because if we go into retirement, especially before the age of 62, so before the age that you can claim Social Security, you've got to bridge your retirement income with something, whether that's your IRA, a 401k, a 403b, a brokerage account, cash on hand, whatever. And so when we're bridging from 
where we're retiring to when we want to claim Social Security, we want to make sure we're looking at what the markets are doing, what the overall economy is doing. Because let's say you step into retirement and the market crashes. OK, let's say you step into retirement and the market goes down. Well, maybe you decide to claim Social Security earlier than you anticipated to let your retirement investments come back up, right? Or if the market has a bull run and it does really well, maybe you claim Social Security later than you expected because social or because the market has done so well. So when we're building out these Social Security plans, when we're building out the optimization plans for clients and especially for for Stephen and Claire, because they are one's working and one's a homemaker. So Social Security is a big decision. We want to make sure that whatever we build in, it's flexible. It can't just be like, you know, when you read a Forbes article or a Barron's or whoever, and they're like, oh, I'll take Social Security at 67. Tell me why. Isn't that a song? Tell me why. Tell me why. Like, tell me why. Backstreet Boys or NSYNC? I don't know which one it was. That was when I was growing up. But tell me why we're claiming Social Security at the age we're going to do it and make sure that's flexible. OK, so we're going to do 67 for Stephen. Now, Claire has been a homemaker for most of their life. Now, she does have enough credits for Social Security, uh, which is 40 credits. And you earn those per quarter as long as you make more than fifteen hundred dollars per quarter, which is basically 10 years of working, which is pretty simple to do. She's got the credits for Social Security, but she has a benefit that is less than half of Stephen's benefit. So for Claire, what we're going to do is we're going to do a spousal benefit. And we're going to do a spousal benefit at 67. Now, Claire is five years younger than Stephen. So as a spouse, if she wants to claim a spousal benefit, she could do it as early as 62, as long as Stephen is claiming Social Security. So if Stephen claims at 62, she'll be 60, what, 61 at that point. So she can't claim yet. So she has to wait till she's 62. If she does that, she'll get a reduced benefit, like 32%. But if she waits till 67, she'll get a full 50% of Stephen's benefit, his 67 benefit. Now, if Stephen decides, or if we are going through this plan, and he decides to wait till 70 or 68, 69 or 70 to claim Social Security, Claire cannot get a spousal benefit until Stephen is claiming. And it's still only half of his 67 benefit, not 68, 69, or 70. So we always want to be aware of that. So we're going to claim at 67 for her, and that's going to be half of what Stephen's is. So let me grab my calculator since we're live. I don't want to make the math wrong because you guys will call me out. 1600 is a spousal benefit. Now, projected COLAs for Social Security are 2.58%. That's just kind of the average since the 1970s. If you look at the COLA, we started in 1975, and you can kind of see what, what that's done. The 49-year average is 3.71. The 10-year average is 2.58. I assume we're going to be closer to this number, but if I use a lower COLA, you know, a lot of people comment on the channel, like, you don't use your COLA on Social Security, right? And I'm like, well, I would rather be more conservative with the COLA because if I'm conservative with the COLA, and the plan works, then if the COLA is generous, the plan going to work even better, which is why when you see rates of return in the market and things like that, I'm always really, really conservative. Now, Stephen does still work. His current gross monthly salary, his annual salary is $150,000 a year, which means it's $12,500 gross per month. All right. Claire is a homemaker. So what we're going to say is let's push their retirement out till June. So we're going to retire in June of this year, or we're going to try to retire in June of this year. Remember, we've got $650,000 in assets. So we go to assets here. So let's add in some of our assets. Now, there's a lot of different things that we can do within the plan when we're doing this. Now, listen, if you want a financial EKG, how to get one, it's all in the description below. You can actually go to our website, or you can go to the calendar link in the description below. You can go to our website. You can go to visit with us, and you can set up a date and time that works best for you. We're actually <laughs> booked all of March, but today's March 30th. So what do you know? Okay, so let's go to assets for a minute. So we've got money that's in the bank, first off. And again, I'm going to make this really simple for you guys so you can just kind of see how we do this. Obviously, it's a little bit more in-depth when we're actually building out a full retirement income plan for someone, okay? 
So we've got the bank. That's $50,000. We're not making any monthly contributions into that. Steven has a 401k through work. And it's at risk, obviously, because the money is in the market. It's about $500,000. It's, it's kind of it goes up and down based on where the market's at. But when I took these stats, it was $500,000. Now, he does get a five. He makes a 5% contribution. So his contribution is 5% and it's pre-tax. So it's not a raw 401k. So on his money, he's putting in 5% of salary, which is $625. And the company is putting in a 5% match. They've got a pretty good match. $625 match. So we've got a total contribution of $1,250 going into his 401k on a monthly basis. $625 come from him and $625 coming from the company. Now, I did not mention they are in the state of Tennessee. So there is a state income tax when we look at this. And there's a federal income tax when we look at this. Uh, what's Tennessee? Rocky Top, right? Rocky Top will always be. I, I can't sing that song. Though. I'm from Kentucky. So we, as, a, as a Go Big Blue guy, it's hard for me to hear Rocky Top. All right, 401k. We've got $500,000 in that. We also have a brokerage account. They have it Fidelity. So this would be non-qualified, meaning it's the tax on the interest, the dividends, capital gains, capital losses you get to write off. They're managing this themselves. Uh, where'd you go? There we go. They're managing this themselves, different stocks, ETFs, about a hundred grand. And they're currently not adding anything to that. What they do with this money is they add in extra money that they've got, things like that. So we're not going to show that at this point because we are trying to figure out if we're going to retire. So here's what we've got. We've got $650,000 in total assets. We're 55 years old. We're asking the question, can I retire? Now, I mentioned earlier about the bridge. So if we retire at 55, now they've got a 401k and they've got a non-qualified account. So let me tell you, there's two ways that they can get, that Stephen and Claire can get retirement income if they retire at 55. So Stephen's 401k allows for the rule of 55. Now what the rule of 55 says is if you are terminated, if you retire, if you leave your job in the year that you turn 55, you can use your current 401k for retirement income without paying a 10% penalty. That applies to 403Bs as well. I get questions on 457 plans. 457 plans do not have a 10% penalty as long as you've left the government. So 401ks, 403Bs, if you're under the age of 59 and a half, you leave your job in the year you turn 55, you can use your 401k, 403B for retirement income without paying a 10% penalty. So for them... If we retire at 55, we've got this 401k that we can use for retirement income, but we also have this brokerage account. And in the brokerage account is what I call a freedom fund. So this is our freedom money, okay? Anytime you're adding money to an account outside of a 401k, an IRA, a Roth IRA, a SEP, a 403b, a four, any kind of qualified retirement plan, if you're adding money to a brokerage account, I call this money a freedom fund. Why do I call it a freedom fund? I call it a freedom fund because it gives you the freedom to retire whenever you want. It gives you the freedom to buy a car with cash. It gives you the freedom to do whatever you want. And so that freedom money doesn't have any limitations. Like you can put as much money in, you can take as much money out. The only limitations are what you put on it personally. Maybe you say, I'm going to buy and hold this stock for a certain amount of time. Well, that's your limitation. You do pay taxes on dividends, interest, and capital gains. But that is pretty tax efficient compared to pulling money out of an IRA or a 401k. So what I always tell my clients and what I'd love to see is people putting money. If you've, if you've got a 401k, if you've got a, a, a company plan and you're putting money into it and you're getting a match, that's fantastic. I want you to max out your 401ks, max out your 403bs, do all that stuff. But if you have extra money, don't put it into the bank unless you need to build up your bank account. Obviously, you want to have six months of savings and an emergency fund. But put that money into a brokerage account because what you can do is you can build up this freedom fund just like they've done here. We've got the 401k that they're contributing to, but they've built up this freedom fund that will allow them to at any time use this money without having to worry about 
the government or the IRS. Obviously, if you have a large capital gain, I did a video recently. Actually, it's not been recently. It's probably been two years now talking about how to pay off your home early. And a lot of people have used their brokerage account because of where the market had run and they use that money to pay off their house. Well, they pay capital gains on that. So if you have a huge gain, you're going to pay capital gains. But there's nobody that's going to say, hey, John, hey, Stephen, hey, Cheryl, hey, whoever, you can't take money out of that account until a certain age. No, you can do whatever you want. Obviously, it's, it's fluctuating what the market is. You can invest in anything you want. So there's no limitations like in a 401k. So I love it, love it, love it when people are building up. Freedom funds. Good morning, Trey. Fast Eddie. Go Yankees. Not this year. I'm telling you. Watch out for the Rays. You got one of the best pitching staffs in baseball. Just watch out. Rays, uh, the Yankees are actually about 10 minutes from here. Uh, they, they did spring training. So enjoyed seeing some Yankee games uh, for spring training. Now, protected assets. We do have a house. So they have their real estate, which is their home. Whoops, not a health savings account. It is real estate. It's low risk and it's worth, what's it worth? $400,000. Now they don't have any, they don't have any debt. They don't have any mortgage. So they live in, uh, they live in Tennessee. They've got a little bit uh, lesser cost of living uh, where they're at compared to, they're not near the Nashville area or the Franklin, Tennessee area. They're more near the Knoxville area. So they've got a lower cost of living. They put a lot more money into their house, you know, paying that off than they were saving, which is why at 55, again, they've got a really good amount of money saved for the average person at 55. I think if you look at the average saved at, you know, personal savings at 55, retirement savings, whatever, uh, it's in the, like the five digit range, like $50,000. So they're in a really good place. Don't get me wrong, but they don't have a mortgage because they put a lot more money towards that over putting money into their investment account. So here's what we've got. Total investments. We've got $650,000 in spendable assets and we've got $400,000 in protected assets, which means we have a total portfolio value of $1,050,000. So we're looking at this and we're saying, okay, we've got $650,000 that we can use for retirement right now. We've got $400,000 of a house that we can't use unless we sell it. They're in a lower cost area of Tennessee. So if they were to leave and go to like Florida or a higher cost area, then they would probably use all of this money to pay for a new place, but they could down, downsize in their current location where all their kids are at, okay? Rob says, what's up, go Bosa. I've got Red Sox and Yankee fans. What's the deal? Can we get out of the American League East? Anybody else here, like any other team outside of the rivals for the Rays? Can we, can we, can we work on this a little bit? Maybe. Got any Giants fans? How about the Cubs, Reds, Mets? Anybody? So we got one million fifty in total portfolio value. Now, what I'm looking at as a as an advisor as well are these two columns here and these two columns here. And I'm going to skip risk classification for this live stream because I don't have enough time for that. But I want to talk about taxes for a second. And and don't pay attention to legacy yet. Legacy is how much money is left over when you die. It's showing $4 million, but we haven't added in expenses yet. We haven't added in taxes. We haven't done anything. So this is, psh, psh, don't look at that yet. So we're looking at this current thing. We're looking at this current pie chart right now. And if you see this red, this red means stop, pay attention, and do something about it. So we've got 76% or 77% of our money is qualified, meaning when we take the dollar out of that account, we're going to pay taxes on that money, right? If you pull money out of your 401k, your 403b, your IRA, if they are pre-tax, traditional, you will pay dollar for dollar on that money. So that's something we need to look at. Do we need to do something different? Now, unfortunately for Stephen, we do not have the ability to do a Roth 401k at his job. So there's no, no, no ability for that. So we got to look at other facets. Can we do Roth conversions? What's that look like tax-wise? All that stuff. We've got 15% of non-qualified money. We just talked about freedom funds and why that's important. And we've got 7.69% of 1099 interest. That's money in the bank. So we want to look at this. And what I'd like to see is more of this dark green here and this non-qualified green there. The bank's okay. Obviously, we can get better rates today than we could um, you know, 12 months ago in the bank. So if we got more money in the bank or earn 3 or 4%, that's great. But I want to see more non-qualified, more Roth money inside of this portfolio. So what we do now is we go over to expenses. Now their expenses are pretty simple. 
we've got five thousand dollars in expenses so what i normally do and again this is more of a simplistic retirement income plan for you guys but when we're going through a more when i'm doing a financial ekg for a client for a couple we go through a more extensive look at expenses and what we do is i actually will send you an expense plan basically it's a budget and i want to see what your expenses are now i don't care what you spend your money on like if you want to go to starbucks that's fine with me i don't care i go to starbucks i don't care what i really want to see is what are your expenses like let's say for instance you have a mortgage okay what's your mortgage when does that mortgage end because you're not going to have that mortgage for your entire retirement and i want to take inflation on your mortgage and put a zero on it because if you have a fixed rate mortgage which most people have then you're going to have a zero inflation rate. That payment is going to continue to go, right? It's going to continue to stay at $1,200, $2,000. So I want to do an advanced expense plan to get a better idea of what your true inflation rate is. Now, again, for this live stream, we're not going to do that because that takes a lot of time because we go through each individual spending category and we look at what the CPI has been for that individual spending category for the last 30 years. So let's look at current monthly expenses after tax. We're just going to throw in the $5,000 number, which is what they've got. We're going to use an inflation rate of 3.27%. Now, keep in mind, I always get commenters. People say, Drew, inflation's not going to be 3.27%. It's going to be more like 7, 8. Don't you know what's going on with the markets and inflation? I'm like, yes, I do. I see it but it doesn't last forever, right? It's not going to be around forever. So in the next 30 years, we won't have 8% inflation. If we do, we're going to look like Nicaragua or somewhere else, right? We're not going to be where we need to be. We're probably going to be at what the national average has been, which is 3.27%. Now, obviously, we can look at inflation history since 1914. The 109-year average is 3.27%. The current 10-year average is 263 and again, we put a seven a seven percent number on the board in 2021. We put a six and a half percent board on the board in 2022. We'll probably put a five or six on the board in 2023. But if you look, go back to the 70s. You know, like 1968 to 1982, 83ish is when the last time called the years of the Great Inflation. So if you look at 68, you can see where inflation was high, right? But then it did come back down. So it, it it's manageable, even in it's not going to be like this forever. OK. John asked the question, how much safely can they withdraw from the 401 and what is the taxes for a couple like that? Hang on tight, John. We're going to get to that in just a minute. Larry Veeman. I hope I said that right. I think you're, maybe it's Larry. Fortunately, I have a great federal pension. There you go. Pensions are great. If you have one, it's a blessing. Um, unfortunately, those are going on the way out in the in the world now cash flows so here's here's some here's where we like to add in so this is cash flows is going to be like your unknown expenses this is going to be for things like um we want to well maybe not unknown that's a bad word what i mean is things that we want like variable expenses like oh hey we want to go on a vacation so we add that into cash flows we want to do that every year for 10 years or we're going to buy a car and this is how much it's going to cost like that's what we put oh we have a daughter that's getting married we need to have that put in the in the plan so for them they want to have a $5,000 annual vacation for 15 years once retired. So we're not going to add that in yet. And the reason we're not going to add that in yet is because we want to get to retirement first to see, is their money going to last? So that's where we're going to go now. Let's go to retirement. And then we're going to come back. We're going to work our way backwards. So some of this, we, we have to kind of look forward and then we work backwards. So we'll go to retirement to see how long their money is going to last. And then we'll work backwards to see what adjustments we need to make for that. And keep in mind, if you want an EKG, we do this as a fee for service, as a, as a one-time fee. Or if you want an advisor or, you know, an, an actual, you know, an advisor that does this for you, go to the details section, get in touch with us. We'd love to talk with you. Our calendar link is there. Okay, so here's what we look at. Stephen and Claire. We've got a red line. Red means stop. Red means, uh-oh, something's going on. 
Uh, rate of return needed to avoid a shortfall, 11.25%. We need $3.5 million. That's if they want to retire today. So we look at this and we go, okay, we've got $653 in spendable assets. We've got $5,000 in expenses, and boom, we're out of money at 63 and 58, well before we hit Social Security. So, you know, unfortunately, we still have a $400,000 home, which is fine. Uh, you know what? Actually, I didn't do something. Let's go back to assets real quick. We got to give a rate of return. I was like, man, that's soon. So bank money, let's do some rates of return here. Let's just say the bank's going to earn 1%. Obviously, it's going to earn more than that. Let's put a 6% rate of return on the 401k and the brokerage account. Let's put a 1% rate of return on the house. Six, six, six. And obviously, we're just kind of doing this in simple terms. The reason I use 6% um, is because the stock market's averaged 8% with inflation since the 1950s, 12% over the last 10 years with inflation. I like 6 it's 2% behind the market. That's for me. I was just doing a retirement income plan yesterday for a couple in Texas, and they wanted 5%. Actually, the, the husband said 6 the wife said four. So I said, how about five? Why don't we split the difference? So we started with five when we were looking at rates of return. We can put in whatever you want, but I just like 6% to start out. So we go to retirement now. All right, that's a little better. So we get to 67 and 62. So we're still out of money too early. So the question is, can we retire at 55 with $650,000 in retirement savings? Not with the $5,000 in expenses. Because you can see these $5,000 in expenses are going up, 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 up. So what we do is I, the first thing I always like to go back to a client, and I'll say there's two things that we can do, right? In retirement, there's things you can control and there's things you cannot control. What you can control are your expenses, when you retire, when you claim Social Security, how you're invested. Those are things you can control. What you can't control, you can't control inflation, I can't control the stock market. I can't control political risk. I can't control uh, uh, foreign risk. So there's things that we can't control. So what we have to do is we have to put ourselves in position of controlling what we can control and let the rest of the pieces fall where they may. And so we have to look back again and we say, OK, based on worst case scenarios, what can we do to put ourselves into position to retire? So for them, we're looking at this and we say, OK, we've either got to lower our expenses, right? We've got to lower this because they don't have a mortgage. So they're spending $5,000 a month on something and it's not a mortgage. So we've got to say we can lower this or we have to retire later or work part time. Right. And when I say retire later and work part time, I always get people like cringing. Like, oh, I don't want to do that. But, I, you know, sometimes that's the case. And again, this is a, a very simple um, scenario. This is not a hard scenario. So let's look at this. Let's say when can we retire? Like when are we able to retire? If five thousand dollars in expenses is what we need, then maybe we can't retire for another five years. So if we do that, if we wait five years, we're going to have our contribution continuing for five years, which means our money is going to continue to grow for five years, right? Five years longer, which means when we get to retirement, look at this. We're out at 87 and 82 now, which means we're moving in the right direction, which is what, like, what I like to see. Okay, there's our house growing. There's our assets. Now, here's the thing, too, to also look at. I go to pre-retirement. What I like about this tab is the pre-retirement tab breaks everything down. We've got our monthly. Oops, get out of there. We've got this green line here. What this green line tells us is that based on our monthly salary, based on our contributions, based on our net monthly income. So this is net net monthly expenses. We've got about four thousand dollars left over each month. Now, again, the reason I like to do the advanced expense plan and I do advanced if you if we're doing a your financial EKG for you, we are going through an advanced expense plan because I want to know, hey, this is exactly how much we're saving each month. And what we're looking at is saying, like, this is our income. 
this is how much is going to contributions and this is how much is going to taxes. And we want to look at this on a monthly basis. So you can say, OK, hey, look, gross income, 143. There's our standard deduction of 27.7, which is not going to last but another two years. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So we've got taxable income of 115.306. So there's our taxes, right? Puts us in the 11.18% federal tax rate. So what we can look at is say, oh, we're saving some money. So I can go back to the client and say, like, are you actually seeing this? Like, are you seeing this in your stuff? And they can say, well, yeah, we are actually doing that. And so we go back. And I say, well, how about what if we took like the four thousand you're saving each month? Can we go to like, can we just add like a thousand dollars monthly? Can we put, can we put a thousand dollars in here, and let's do that till we retire. And then let's see what that does pre-retirement wise. Now look at that. That bug bumps us over a million bucks because we're now we're adding twelve thousand dollars. We were at forty four you know, 4,400 net. Now we're at 34. So we're able to save more. Again, that's putting money into that freedom fund. Now, I know it's not fun because now they've retired a little longer than they wanted to, but now that we're adding more money, we may be able to adjust this back. Again, we're trying to figure out, like I don't have pixie dust, like Disney World's about an hour and a half away from me down I-4, which I-4 is like the worst road ever. Don't, if you, if you live in Florida, you want a helicopter to get anywhere if you have to be on I-4. But, and I don't have a helicopter. So we, we I drive a minivan. Uh, I gave up my man car a few years ago. I had a Ford F-150. But then I have three beautiful children. And they wouldn't all fit in the truck. And so uh, we gave up the truck for a Honda Odyssey minivan. And it's, a, it's I call it a, I call it a dragon, or what do they call it? A SpaceX rocket. I, I try to make myself look cool in it. But it's a minivan. A minivan is a minivan. Um so what we look at is we say, okay, I can't sprinkle pixie dust and make this work. Like I can't magically make it work, but we can look at the facts and make it work. So we can say, okay, if we're, if this is true, maybe we can retire a little sooner if we're able to add, like if we're at 922 at 58, does that work? Right? So then we can go back to the scenario and we can back up two years. Now we're at 58. You can see it here. There's 58. We're at 80 and 75. So it's it kind of backed it up a little bit more. We don't want to do that. So we go back here. Let's go back to 60. Let's go back to the pre-retirement. And we say, okay, can we add any more? Is that something that you're willing to do? Are you willing to spend a little less? A lot of times what happens is people send me their advance, their expenses, right? It'll be $5,000 a month. That's their base expenses. And they're spending everything else. Not in a bad way, right? They're spending this money just on fun. They're like, oh, I'm I'm making a ton of money and we're just going to, their kids are basically gone for the most part. So they're enjoying life, which I want you to enjoy life. Like I don't want you eating ramen noodles so you can retire early. I want you to enjoy life. Life is short, right? COVID taught us anything. Life is short, right? The Bible says that life is like a vapor. Like it's gone. Like I'm 37. 17 years ago, I was playing baseball like in college. And, and I'm like, what happened? I got three kids, a house and a minivan. Like what happened? Um, and so we've got to, you know, we've got to enjoy life, but I can say, Hey, out of this, can we do anything else? So we go back to assets and they say, Oh yeah, we can maybe do 2000. So we go to $2,000 a month. That's $24,000 a year. Now let me say this guys, this is not unheard of. I've got so many clients that I am doing this exact thing for. I'm working with a couple right now in Alabama where they he actually worked for the state and is getting a pension, but they're actually still needing to work to save more money. So he took his pension at 60 because it doesn't go up from there. You have, you know, you basically need to take it at 60 and he's reinvesting it, even though he's going to work for another five years. And I've got other clients. I've got a client I'm working with right now in Orlando that they're still working. They've got about 10 to 15 years from retirement. But they're like, hey, we've got an extra thousand dollars a month. Let's do this. Now, their kids are younger. And so we've got college and other things going on. But this is not unheard of to build up this freedom fund. And really what we're trying to do is just say, again, we're trying to build a plan. Like if I'm going to go from here to Atlanta, like I could just drive up 75, but I would rather have a plan like, OK, we're going to go up. 75. If there's an accident, we're going to go around here. 
all that kind of stuff. I want to have a map because how can I, as an advisor, as a fiduciary advisor, how can I make recommendations to a client on the investments they need to be in, in their IRAs, 401ks, in the tax strategy, anything, if I'm not looking at their plan? I literally, I had a, cl- a couple in yesterday. We're going, we were doing the Zoom and they're in Texas and they're moving to Portugal. Isn't that cool? They're going to retire and move to Portugal. And we were going through their plan. I'm actually going to do a, a video on it here soon once we're done. But we we're going through everything. And I said, guys, your investments are like super risky. Why? And they were like, well, that's just what our advisor did, you know, because we were trying to save more money because we got started later. And I was like, but based on your plan, all you need to earn now, and they're in there, I think they're 59 and 57. I said, based on your plan now, all you need to earn is about four to five percent. But your investments are down 20 percent compared to the S&P, only down 11. So we've really got to be careful when we're looking at these and saying, what's the plan? And is our advice based on the plan? OK, let me see if I can go into these comments here. Punisher 66, I came across your page over a month ago. I like the way you explain things. St. Louis in the house. But the owner of the Astros went to my high school. That doesn't mean you have to like the Astros. You can still like the Cardinals. Cardinals are okay. I, I've read some books on Tony La Russa and the Cardinals. Uh, enjoy them. Uh, Cardinals, actually, if you look at baseball history, the Cardinals were some pioneers. We can thank, um, oh, what's his name? I can't think of his name now. He was the general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers. He's the one that signed Jackie Robinson, brought Jackie Robinson into Major League Baseball. But the, he was working at the Cardinals, and they brought in, uh, they started the minor leagues. So we can thank all minor league baseball on the St. Louis Cardinals. Cool. Ray Anderson says, many vans are forever. Mama loves her, and she's on her fourth one. I never cared for them, but with kids, they sure. Yeah, man. Ray, you can open the doors with like a push of a button, right? We can move the seats. Um, they're pretty cool. They're pretty cool. But, uh, you know, again, I had to give up my man card for the minivan. Um, perfect. All right, cool. Let's go back to the scenario. So now we're going to add $2,000. We're going to go back to pre-retirement and we're going to say, oh, look, look at that 95 and 90. So if we go to retirement, look at this. We're out of money at 95 and 90. Zero here. Our house is worth $601,000. We still have Social Security at $9,404. That's with the COLA. We could also do a reverse mortgage, sell the house. You know, I've got clients who sell their, a client who's just recently, they're selling their house. They're taking $200,000, putting it in their portfolio. The other $400,000 or $300,000, something like that, they're using to buy their, they're, they're actually going into a condo. So it, they're taking five hundred, dollars they're splitting it up. So that's something they could do as well too. So this is, we're getting, we're on the right track. All right. Now I've got about 19 minutes before I got to eat a turkey sandwich. Um, And so I want to talk about taxes. Now let's talk taxes because taxes, 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 because that's what's going to happen guys over the next few years. The tax code has changed in 2026. The current tax code, which was legislated under president Trump expires in the year 2026. If Congress doesn't do anything, which is probably what's going to happen, then the tax code is going to revert back to the legislation that was under that was enacted under President Obama, which actually is about 25 percent higher than we were are we are today. Now, the elephant in the room is this. We got what, 33 trillion dollars in debt. What's the national? What do we, what's the national debt today? National debt clock. Let's see where we're at today. Uh, let me bring this over so you guys can see it. What are we at today? We've got thirty-one trillion six hundred forty-nine thousand six. Was that? No, wait. Thirty-one trillion. I got to do the math. I'm from Kentucky. We don't get so big in numbers. Thirty. Let's just say thirty-two trillion dollars. Let's just round up. But here's our taxes, right? And does it show how much each individual owns in taxes? There's a social security liability, liability per citizen, $545,000, $545,000, total debt to GDP, 133.97, oh, debt per citizen, oh, that's local, here's uh, state debt, goodness gracious, what are we going to do? 
We're going to raise taxes. That's what we're going to do. We're going to raise taxes. So we need to talk about it. So here we go. So in the year 2023, for Stephen and Claire, they're in the 11% federal effective tax rate. So here's their wages. Here's our qualifying contributions. Here's our 1099 interest. There's our gross income, 142,918. So the deduction is 27,7. That's the standard deduction. They could have estimated, they could have uh, itemized deductions that would be higher than that, but you've got to have more than 27,7. Most people, I think like 98% of the country file standard deduction. Taxable income is 115. Now we have a progressive tax code, right? Here's our progressive tax code. So the first $22,000 in income is at zero. 22 to 89, 12 and all that stuff, okay? So here's our base, base tax over base. So our federal tax is 15,963, which is being withheld by his W-2, okay? His, you know, what W-2 and FICA taxes. So we're in the 22% bracket, but we're effective tax rate is 11.17. OK, now, when I look at this, I see that we're only contributing seventy five hundred dollars. Now, remember what we were just talking about. When we look at pre-retirement, we see how much money they're saving. You know, each month they're not spending. So we're adding in money to their freedom fund. But we can also if we want to, if if Stephen wants to. He can increase his monthly contribution. He's only contributing 5% to his 401k. All right. So he's contributing 5% to his 401k. He's getting a 5% match from the company. So what we can do is we can obviously increase the contribution. So what if we said, hey, what if you increase your contribution? One, two, three, four, five percent more. Right. Because we've got a cushion of 2490, 2322, 2149. We've got this cushion. Can you do that? Now, again, I don't want to take away all their spendable fund money, but what if we increase their contribution? Let's just do, uh, let's do a 2% increase, which would be $250. So add that in. So we do a 2% increase. They're getting a 5% match. So now when we go to taxes, now we have 10,500 in qualified contributions. We still have federal tax about $15,000, which, which is showing up on you know, a W-2. So these are things that we can try to control. Again, it brings our effective ta tax rate under 11. Now we're at 10.94, which is great. We go back to pre-retirement. It only takes away a little bit of that you know, excess income there. It pushes us from 95 and 90 to 96 and 91. So again, these are things, again, this is a financial EKG. This is what we do. This is how we work with clients. We do this on Zoom and we're, we're working through these scenarios for people to say what's going to be the most efficient strategy for you. And so it's not always like a lot of times in my industry, everybody, you know, most advisors want to make it easy. They want to put you in like this cookie cutter thing. Well, I don't want to do that. We want to put a strategy together that's individualized for you. I want to put a strategy that's that is not just, hey, do this. And this is what everybody else is doing, like talking to your neighbors, like you talk to your neighbor and like, oh, yeah, they're all doing this. This is what I should do. This is a stock you need to buy because everybody else is doing it. We want to say, OK, Stephen and Claire, when are you wanting to retire? What are you saving? What are your contributions? What are your I don't care about the Joneses. Right. I live next door. I like the Joneses. There's a song called I want to go back. Uh, I can't remember who the artist is. He's like, I want to go back to when the Joneses were just our neighbors and we played together. We don't have to keep up with them. We have to build a retirement plan that's built for us. And that's what we try to do with your financial EKG. We want it to be individualized for you in your situation, your family. Because listen, when you're 96, the Joneses won't care. So build a plan that's built for you, not someone else. And if you want to meet with us, all the all information is in the description below. Or you can go to Pearl Wealth Group. That's our website, pearlwealthgroup.com. Click on schedule a visit and you can come visit with us in April because it's it's already late March. Come visit with us in April um, or check out our website too. We've got a lot of good stuff on the blog. You can learn stuff about us. Let's go back here. Okay, cool. So let's go back to taxes. So here's what we're looking at. We're saying, okay, what can we do to help lower taxes? Now we want to go to like, what's, what's our tax situation going to look like when we retire? So for them, if we retire at 60, 
we're going to be using, let me adjust our withdrawal buckets. So we go to a draw order. Let's do some adjusting here. We don't want to take money from the bank first. And let's push this up first. So let's use this freedom fund first. Because here's what I want to look at. I want to look at doing some Roth conversions. So what I don't want to do is when you do a Roth conversion, you move money from your IRA or 401k once it's an IRA to a Roth IRA. When you do that, when you make that move in the middle here, you got to pay taxes on the money you move in the year that you do it. So if you do a Roth conversion in 2023 of $20,000, that $20,000 gets added in to your taxable income. So we'd have $150,000 in wages, $10,000 in qualified contributions. We'd have a $20,000 and an other. Okay. So that means we'd actually be at 159 in gross income. So when you're doing a Roth conversion, you want to say, and we're going to use it for like, we're going to do a Roth conversion. We don't want to have double taxation, especially if we're going to do Roth conversions once we get into retirement. Right. So I want to use this brokerage account money, this freedom fund for income first. And then we look at the Roth conversions. And keep in mind on Roth conversions, you have a five year wait for each conversion that you do. Not just like so Roth conversion and Roth contribution are two different things and two different five year rules. Contribution is when you start a Roth IRA and you do a five and you put money into it, that starts your five year window before you can take money out of the Roth IRA, the, in, the earnings, right? Not the, not the principal, like what you put in, you can get out, but the earnings. With a conversion, if you convert money in the year 2023, you got to wait five years before you can touch that money. Principal and all, because there's really not principal, right? All. If you do another conversion in 2024, you got to wait another five years, which is different from contribution. So make sure you understand the rules, okay? Talk to your CPA. Don't blame me. Talk to your CPA. But you can call me. So we want to do this. So let's look at this. Let's go back down here. Let's look at taxes. So here we go. 76.92 is what our qualified balance is. Can we adjust this tax-wise at all? So we go to assets and we say, okay, we've got 500 there. When do we want to start doing the Roth conversions? Well, you see how we have a little bit of a cushion in money here? Again, we're, it's all about the plan. We got a little cushion here. What if we do some conversions and use this cushion money? We've got 23,000 in cushion. Can we use that for taxes? Does that make sense? Does the client want to do that? So we can go to cash flows. Or actually, let's just do it the easy way. We can go to tax tracker here. And let's just see if it makes sense with the software first. Go to options. Let's do a five year conversion. We're going to earn 6% on this money. And let's apply. Let's see if it makes sense. Okay, so here we go. So today's balances are zero or 500,000. Our projected lifetime tax is 583. Doing the Roth conversions puts us at 458,160. So what we want to look at is if we do the Roth conversions, does that shorten our retirement income? So let's apply it. It's going to create a new scenario for us, which is awesome. Go to retirement. And we're still out at 96 and 91, which means that the Roth conversions didn't lessen the amount of time that our income is going to last. So we go to reports and print. Current scenario. See, we're out. Actually, the current scenario, we're out at 94 and 89. Doing the Roth conversion, we're out at 96 and 91. So it actually makes it better doing the Roth conversions. And why is that? Because of this taxation. 583 versus 458 means there's less money being having taxes on it. So again, guys, this is why we want the plan. We want a plan when we're doing our retirement income planning. We don't want it to just be something that's willy nilly. Listen, if you got questions or comments, leave those in the comments section here. I've got about, I don't know, five more minutes and I'm going to eat a turkey sandwich. So we see how these, how tax taxes are a big deal. Now, here's the thing too, to think about. Let's go back to scenarios. Let's just do the current scenario. Let's go to taxes. Now, let's change the taxes. So in the year 2026, we're going to see an increase in taxes. Let's say it goes up 25%, okay, which is kind of the Obama era taxes. We save that. So now we're going to have higher taxes in 2026. So 2023, we're in the projected 10% tax bracket. We go to, actually, let me change something real quick. 
We got to do a deduction change. Uh, okay, we're going to have to finagle this a little bit. Uh, okay, we're not going to do that now. I don't want to do that on, this, on the live stream. So 10.94% is that. We go to 2027 when taxes have changed. Look, we bumped up to 13.68. So that's taxes changing. So again, you might think, well, that's only 3%, but we're at $15,000 in total tax. Remember, now we're at 19,000 in total tax. That's $4,000. And and what, I, what I'm not showing here, guys, because I don't want to get into it because it's too detailed and I'm running out of time, is changing the deduction, right? We're at 27.7 on the deduction, but like we could change it in a certain year. We could bring this deduction down and that's going to raise taxes even more. So I like, I'm not going to, again, this is a simplistic approach, but there's a lot of things that could cause our taxes to go up, which is why it makes a whole lot of sense to look at doing Roth conversions, okay? Or doing any kind of plan. Again, if you're doing a retirement plan or you're working with an advisor, I get a lot of people that call me and say, I want one, I got a free plan. I go, that's great. I'm happy for you. But is that plan dictating the rest of your investments? Is that plan, is that advisor looking at a plan before he gives you investment decisions? And that's really what we've got to look at. Punisher says this, Speak on it. Love the retirement information and term freedom fund. You were talking about Branch Ricky. Thank you, Punisher. Branch Ricky. I actually have a neighbor. His name's Don. Don's 85 years old. He grew up in Baltimore. He remembers listening to the radio when, oh gosh, see, I'm on live. If I wasn't live, I'd tell you, the guy that hit the home run for the Brooklyn Dodgers against the New York Giants, um, golly, what was his name? Anyway. So anyway, me and Don talk a lot about baseball, but he loves Branch Rickey, and he would have known that, no problem. So, okay, perfect. So the question becomes, here's the question. Let's go back to our scenarios. Can I retire at 55 with $650,000? Not in the current scenario, you can't. But can I retire at 60, okay, with a million one? Yeah, you can because we made up all the changes. Now, again, we're looking at this. And one of the things I wanted to show you real quick is kind of cool because I've got, let's see, I got three minutes. Let me show you this. So one of the things that I like to do is go to this longevity calculator. And this is an actuary longevity calculator. And what you can do is you can like put in your name. Uh, I'll put in my name. Put in my date of birth. I was born Christmas Eve. You got it. Send me a gift. Uh, retirement age. Let's say I'm going to retire at, I don't know. I don't feel like I'm ever going to retire with, with my job. I love what I do. Let's say 65. And I'm male. And I don't smoke. And I'm in excellent health. I am in excellent health. So we hit results. And so what this will show me is it'll say, hey, you've got a 100% chance, obviously barring like getting hit by a truck or a meteor or eaten by an alligator, okay? Because we live in Florida. But like, you can kind of get a good idea of how actuaries look at how long you're gonna live, right? So like for Steven, I could go, well, at, we got a 32% chance of getting to 95 based on where I'm at. Now his would be less because his mortality table would be moved up because he's at age 55. But this is a great way, this is longevityillustrator.org. This is a great way for you to get just an idea because people always say, oh, well, I can't, you know, like, I'm going to die at 80 because my parents died at 80 and my uncle died at 80. And I'm like, well, my grandfather died at 65 of asbestos cancer. But today he'd live a lot longer. Right. So healthcare's has come a long way, no matter what, you know, whatever's going on there. All right. Cool. Punisher of St. Louis Browns became the Orioles. Yeah, they did. My grandfather actually played in the St. Louis Browns minor league system. He used to tell me the story when he was playing minor league baseball. Right before he ended his career, there's a guy coming up through the minors for the Yankees. He had a funny name. His name was Mickey, and he couldn't imagine any mother naming their kid Mickey. And as we know today, that was Mickey Mantle, who became one of the greatest center fielders of all time. Tough job replacing Joe DiMaggio in New York. 
but uh, he did it and obviously had some issues uh, personally there as well, probably because of the pressure there in New York. So, all right, guys, I can get off the baseball bandwagon. Go Rays. It's opening day. Thank you guys so much for watching the live stream. Hope you all have a wonderful opening day. God bless. Bye-bye.